Adrian Dix. I'm BC's Minister of Health. To my right is Dr. Bonnie Henry, BC's Provincial Health Officer. We're honoured to be here on the territories of the Lekwungen speaking people of the Esquimalt and the Songhees First Nations. Before I start, I just want to acknowledge uh, the fact that we were late yesterday in presenting our daily data to uh, the media and to the public. I wanted to apologize for that. I know it pushed uh, uh, many members of the media past their deadlines. You'll know that we're going to pre we're going to present the data for today at three o'clock. I can tell you that it's going to arrive uh, at three o'clock, and we'll address uh, the issues raised yesterday. So, with that, I wanted to uh, introduce Dr. Bonnie Henry for our presentation on modeling. I wanted to say that uh, the purpose of that presentation is to update uh, the cur current epidemiology of COVID-19 in BC to compare uh, uh, our current state in BC to previous projections that we had made. As you know, we presented our modeling first amongst the provinces on March the 27th, and that brings that up to date, that we're gonna do that with respect to cases and ICU status. To provide an update on our health system level of preparedness for those who are critically ill with COVID-19, and to highlight the effect of our public health measures and societal action. And of course, to identify the considerations involving next steps, and with that, I'd like to introduce Dr. Henry. Thank you very much. Um, it's a, it's a great um, honor for us to be able to present this information and to give uh, the people of British Columbia an idea of where we've been and where we're going with regards to the pandemic of COVID-19 here in BC. So I'm going to start with presenting what we call the epidemiology. So that is the person, place and time of what has happened of our pandemic in British Columbia. This um, next slide, and for I understand for those of you who, who want, that there's a live streaming at the BC CDC website that will help you, um, that you can look at this as well. I know uh, the last time we presented, there were some challenges in being able to uh, see the slides. But what, um, uh, what this slide shows is what we call the epidemic curve. And that for us in, in uh, public health is a, a depiction of what has happened um, in British Columbia with COVID-19. So the long, uh, the, the um, thick line on the top, the pink line, is what we call the new cases. So this is what we have been reporting every day in British Columbia, the number of new cases of COVID-19 that we've seen. And as you can tell, um, we've been at this for some time. Our first case in British Columbia was in January, and uh, we had a number of imported cases over January and February. And then in early March, we started to see what we call community transmission. So it was importations that had then started to spread between others. And as we know, here in British Columbia, that often involved um, outbreaks at long-term care homes with the first long-term care home outbreak in Lynn Valley in early January. What is also on this slide um, down below is the measures of uh, our new cases in intensive care unit, and that's in the blue at the bottom, and that is a more stable measure of where we are now in this pandemic. It's the number of people who required critical care in our system in BC. And also what we've plotted is the, the yellow line is the number of people who have died from COVID-19 in British Columbia. And of course, that tells us about the impact that this has had on our families and our communities. And we know in British Columbia, a lot of the people who have died are, are, are seniors and elders who've been in long-term care. The next slide is our epidemiologic profile. So that gives you an idea of who has been affected by this virus here in BC. Um, this is uh, the data up until April 14th, where we had 1,517 people who tested positive for the virus in British Columbia. The median age, and we use what's called the median, which is the, the most common, uh, the middle age of people who are affected, rather than the average or the mean, because we know that there's been um, people who are very young and people who are very old who have been affected. And this gives more of an example of the people that are more likely to be infected in British Columbia, and the median age is about 54. And I'll show you some more data on age in a minute. We know that about 53% of the cases so far in British Columbia are, are female, are women, and this often ref this also reflects the fact that um, we have been testing in our healthcare system, and most of our healthcare workers are, are female. 
349 people over the course of the pandemic in BC have been hospitalized, and we can see that the the median age of those who have needed hospital care is about a decade older than those who have been affected. And this again reflects that most young, healthy people have relatively mild illness that is being able to be um, that they are able to care and stay at home and recover at home. Um, the average or the median age of people who have been in hospital in BC has been 68. Uh, currently, we have about 58 people, it's a little less than that today, in critical care or in our ICU system. Uh, we've had 942 people up until uh, April 14th who have recovered. And so those are people who have uh, recovered at home, have been discharged from hospital, have had their ICU care and, and recovered and are now at home as well. We have some limited data on the underlying illnesses that people have and about uh, a third of people, a little over a third, have had at least one chronic condition and those numbers go up as we get older and we have more likely to have um, illnesses like cancer or diabetes or other things that make you more um, likely to have more severe illness. As of the 14th, we had 72 people in British Columbia who died from COVID-19. And the median age of those who died, again, is quite a bit older. So we know that it more differentially affects our seniors and elders. And we know that the long-term care facility outbreaks has led to a large number of people who have been, uh, who have died from this disease and their families and their caregivers have all been affected by that. So the next slide. Um, talks about where geographically we have seen cases and and what you can see is that no region of this province has been spared. We know that there have been outbreaks and there have been cases, there have been imported cases, there's been community transmission in all areas of the province. Having said that, the bulk of the cases are in the, the lower mainland in the Vancouver Coastal and Fraser Health regions. On the next slide, this gives you a, a, an indication of the, the percentage of our population in different age groups that have been affected by COVID-19 in British Columbia. So the bars on the far right, um, the, the pink bars, are the proportion of people in that age group in our population in British Columbia. So we have about a little under 10% of our population is under the age of 10. About 10% are in the 10 to 19 age group. Um, and you can go along and see that. So we have a very small percentage who are over 90. but. When we look at the number of people who've been affected by COVID-19, so that's the, the green bars, uh, um, that are the second bar in from the right, most of the cases have been people that between the ages of 30 and 60. And again, that reflects that we've been doing a lot of testing of our healthcare workers and other essential workers who tend to be in that age group. Those who've required hospitalization, the next bar over, again starts to skew between uh, towards the older age group, the older population. And that continues for those who need intensive care. So those are the, the yellow bars or um, green bars, depending on which of the graphs you're looking at, the next one over. Most of those people who have been uh, required in intensive care and ventilation are people in the 50 to, to 79 year age group. And finally, the bars on the far right are the deaths that we've had in BC from COVID-19. And we've had one um, death in uh, a person in their, in their 40s, um, two um, people in their 60s, but the majority of them uh, have been people who are been, uh, in their 70s, 80s, and 90s, including somebody who was over 100. So this again reflects the tragedy that has been um, the, the outbreaks that we've had in our long-term care homes here in British Columbia. In the next slide, this is um, a, a little bit more detail around the epidemic curve and what it's telling us about the progression of the pandemic here in British Columbia. So uh, this is uh, the cases reported by date by the date 
that their laboratory test came back positive. So this is the information that we've been presenting to you on a daily basis, the new cases that test positive in BC. And what I've put on this slide um, is also two lines that show when our testing strategy changed. And you will recall that earlier on in March, um, we started um, seeing more community transmission and outbreaks in care facilities and we focused our testing on making sure we were understanding what was happening in our community, picking up outbreaks and protecting our health system so that we were able to care for everybody, everybody who had COVID-19 as well as those who needed care in our system. And the grey hashed area, the grey shaded area, um, reflects the time that we put in public health measures. So that's when we started to put in those measures that um, put distance between us as, the, as a way to stop the transmission of this virus in our community and in our families. And so that was when we put in the travel restrictions. We put in the social distancing measures. We put in place the suspension of in-classroom schools, um, the closing of certain um, businesses where people gather together. And what you can see from this is that that occurred over a period of time and we still started and we still saw cases, quite high levels of cases over the next um, number of days. And you may recall my saying that what we were seeing at that time reflected exposures that had happened during the incubation period, so up to two weeks prior um, to that date. And once we got to the two weeks from when we put those measures in place, we start to see a gradual decline in the number of new cases. That's our bending the curve. The second line that I put in on April 9th is when we, uh, last week, when we said that now is our time, we have capacity in our system and to be able to start broadening our testing again to make sure that we aren't missing cases and outbreaks and clusters in our community. On our next slide, this is the same graph but presented by the date of onset of illness. So what I have talked about over the, com the last weeks and months has been what the work that we do in public health to understand each and every case of this disease. And that means looking at when people's symptoms started and it is helpful for us to put that on the, the graph because it helps us understand where and when exposures happened. It also is part of the reflection that we have around contact tracing. So when when I know um, when you started having your symptoms and I know who you've been in contact with, I can isolate those people and make sure that they're not um, passing it on to anybody else if and when they get sick. So that's what this graph is showing and I put in the two lines around the laboratory testing strategy so you can um, equate it to when the test results came back. And what we can see quite clearly is that when we put in these public health measures, we started quite quickly to see a decrease in new cases coming out in British Columbia. The other thing that's reflected on this is where people acquired their illness, for the most part. We don't know for some people, but for most people we're able to plot it. And the, bo the, the bars on the bottom, the dark ones, the blue, that are, is... Um, people who's, uh, who acquired their illness outside of Canada, so from travel. Um, so those are the travel-related cases, and as you can see early on, that's mostly what we had with some limited transmission, mostly within family units. And then we started to get quite a bit more um, early on in March, and a lot of that was reflection of, of travel from the United States, particularly Washington State, when we became aware of the extent of community transmission in, in, in Washington. But we continue to see imported cases of disease and those are ones that we're monitoring very carefully and one of the reasons why we put in the measures that we did at the borders here in British Columbia and now um, across Canada to make sure that everybody who comes home to BC is able um, to join our efforts to make sure we're stopping the transmission of this virus and that means making sure they have a plan and we can support them in self-isolating so that if they do become ill, they're not going to transmit it to their family or their community here in BC. So the next um, four slides are a presentation, are, are, uh, are a, uh, <laughs> the next four slides are, are showing the, the graphs of the um, uh, the trajectories that we presented before with the updated data from here in BC.
So, and uh, some updated data, of course, from the other jurisdictions that we compared ourselves to a few weeks ago when we presented this. So the first one is the cumulative diagnosed cases in British Columbia compared to a number of international, um, uh, a, a number of other international outbreaks. And what this is, is a rate. So it is the number of cases per million population. And we pulled everybody back because we know things were timed at different times around the world. But we pulled everybody back to day one is when you reached uh, two cases per million population. And the reason why BC is a little bit farther out than the rest of Canada is because we hit that marker first. We had the, the, the cases that we had here in BC started earlier and our pandemic started earlier than other parts of Canada. But as you can see, we have flattened that curve. Um, and compared to Canada, we are still at a fairly low but steady rate and we are much lower than uh, what we see for the United States, for Italy, for Spain, for some of the other countries that have had um, outbreaks uh, that have um, followed us in their trajectory. The next slide uh, presents the same information comparing us to other international outbreaks with uh, the rate of deaths that we're seeing in British Columbia. And I know it's a, it's a challenging thing because everybody's outbreak is somewhat different and ours of course has been driven by the tragedy of the deaths in our long-term care homes. But this looks at a rate, so deaths per million population, and it compares where we are in BC with the other jurisdictions around the world. And the challenging thing that we um, need to recognize is that we are at the point in our outbreak where there are still people in hospital, there are still people very ill with this disease, and it is um, it takes some time, weeks, up to six weeks we know from around the world um, before somebody will either recover or may succumb to this disease. So it is unfortunately um, the truth that we are going to see more people die from this disease in the coming weeks weeks here in BC. Uh, the next slide is the same information but uh, presented uh, relative BC relative to our other jurisdictions here in Canada. And I will note that the, the scale on the left hand side is, is not as high as the international one. So we're not comparing Quebec, for example, to Italy. Um, this is a, a, a reduced scale reflecting the fact that we have not seen such um, tremendous increases in, in Canada that they have seen in some other countries. But we can see again that BC is out front um, in terms of time because we had our cases started earlier here in British Columbia, but that we have flattened and leveled over the last few weeks. And again, this is the same presentation of those rates of deaths in British Columbia over the past number of weeks. And again, it has unfortunately increased but has leveled off and we're starting to see that now in Quebec and Ontario as well. So that is the epidemiology that's bringing you up to date with some of the, the modeling that we did earlier to see the trajectory of our pandemic here in BC. And I'm now going to turn it to Minister Dix to talk about uh, some of our operational planning. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Henry. And I wanted to turn to page 15. Uh, this uh, graph will be familiar to everyone from our presentation of March 27th. What we did at that time was, ta take, uh, was to uh, follow or extrapolate from uh, the situation in Italy, in Hubei and in South Korea. What, if we had followed or we were to follow those trajectories, what uh, the uh, epidemic would look like in British Columbia. And so you see this data, you see that Italy was the most serious situation at the time it had not uh, begun to level off at that time. You see the trajectory in Hubei province. You see the trajectory in South Korea. And the intent of this was to be prepared for the worst. And as you know, we've taken a series of steps 
since that time, at that time and since that time to prepare for that. So that you've seen before. I want to move to chart number 16. This tells uh, us what actually has happened since that time. You see, the, we know more about uh, the epidemic in Italy, and that goes forward. We see that Hubei, which had already uh, leveled off at the time of March 27th and of South Korea and you see on the line what's happened in British Columbia. In other words, we are much closer on the cases here because these are the model cases uh, in BC, much closer to South Korea than we were even to Hubei at, the, at that time. On slide 17 as well, we presented this on March 27th when we presented the modeling at that time. Again, you'll see there's one difference between this and the previous chart. We did two models for Italy. There had been a lot of discussion at that time, including in medical circles and concern about the Italian situation, which was quite natural. So you have two models here for Italy, one in the blue based on cases and one uh, on top uh, it based on the highest one based on hospitalization. So you see what that said. And this uh, was the preparation that we would need to make and we needed to make to prepare should those, uh, uh, those trajectories uh, in Hubei, in Italy, become a reality in British Columbia. So that was what we presented March 27th. And now on page 18, you'll see uh, what has happened uh, since then. On page 18, you'll see British Columbia uh, has, uh, is in between uh, Hubei and South Korea in terms of critical care cases, which is uh, the, the, one of the ways that we measure this and obviously the most important ways for people working in acute care hospitals. And so you see the trajectory of uh, critical cases in British Columbia. You'll know a little over a week ago that that peaked at about 72 cases. It's now at around 55, um, but you'll see that we uh, are well under Hubei, of course, dramatically under what happened in Italy, although a little above South Korea. I want to give enormous credit to our critical care teams who were involved in the development of our strategy. They've done a number of things, including early venting, including providing oxygen earlier than had been done in other places. And so our numbers are slightly higher than they would otherwise be because of the extraordinary work of our teams. And you see that in the results of people who've uh, gone into hospital in BC. So what are the key findings of these things? The key findings are that we're well uh, below the projections based on the Italian and Hubei experiences, that BC COVID-19 cases have plateaued and started to decline in terms of hospitalization and in terms of critical care. And uh, for example, hospitalizations a little over a week ago peaked at about 149 and is at 120 now. The most important fact of that is that it peaked at 149, well below, um, well, well within our capacity to deal with it. Uh, similarly, that uh, BC's COVID-19 ICU census curve has remained well below the Hubei and Italian experience. This too appears to be plateauing and we have cautious optimism about a downward trend, but only cautious optimism. Deaths, of course, continue to be particularly profound amongst those who are elderly and frail, and Dr. Henry talked about long-term care. So given these findings, you're not going to see when we provide future modeling the Hubei and Italian models anymore because as reference points for BC, they're now less important. The new models are going to be based on our experience in BC and understanding of the virus will guide us as we go forward. I just wanted to talk briefly and before I turn it back to Dr. Henry about uh, the uh, health system level of preparedness for those who are critically ill. Over the past weeks, and we've described it, uh, uh, Dr. Henry and I have described this in our daily briefings, as have people from the health authorities. The health authorities have prepared across BC for ill and critically ill patients. They've created capacity through decanting patients, finding uh, uh, access and supports for patients who do not absolutely need to be in the hospital, and of course, by, um, by the actions we've taken with respect to elective procedures and surgeries. Critical care capacity has been prepared and added in each health authority through the creation of 19 COVID-19 sites throughout BC. And you'll know additional sites have been created at the Convention Center at Royal Columbia Hospital, for example. Each primary uh, COVID-19 site has sp specifically planned their space, their workforce, and their supplies, including ventilator capacity, to address a surge based on the models that we presented to you on March 27th. On page 22, 
you'll see some of the results of that in terms of bed capacity. That our total critical care beds with surge capacity, the surge capacity we added, which is, you'll, you'll remember, included cardiac care units, recovery rooms, operating room capacity, and the reconfiguration of units has increased significantly um, to 951. And you'll see here in the next two columns um, the, uh, the census data that we have. This is based on uh, the April 13, 14 data, which was 58 critical care COVID-19 cases of 58. And uh, there's also, of course, um, non-COVID-19 census of critical care, which is at 370. Uh, 377. I'll note that there's a small error, I think, to the, on Fraser Health here that should be 209 to come down to add up to 516. The overall critical care uh, capacity of the province, um, occupancy rate, I should say, the total vacant critical care uh, beds are 516, and therefore the occupancy rate is 45.7 percent in critical care. These are the numbers, uh, the detail of the numbers that we've been reporting to you every day for the last number of weeks. They show that we have prepared for this. I, sh I would note that some of that critical care capacity, should we return at some point, as we expect to, uh, to providing elective surgeries, will be taken up by that, and that's an important consideration as we consider the coming uh, weeks and months. I'm going to move on to page 23, which talks about uh, our ventilator capacity, and uh, uh, we can certainly answer questions of this in detail. You'll note that, on, uh, that we had uh, originally identified 457 adult critical care ventilators. There are, of course, 12, there were at the time 1,272 total ventilators in the province, but these were the, uh, the primary ones we would use to address issues around uh, COVID-19. Uh, since then, we've made significant additions. We've moved as you can see in column one, a number of uh, the new ventilators we've obtained and the refurbished ones we've obtained into the Interior Health Authority and the Northern Health Authority. We have a number of ventilators that are not assigned at present, and we've added considerably to our ventilator capacity. That, that capacity has now gone from 457 uh, at the beginning of March to 681 now. And uh, the next slide, page 24, will show uh, how we've been using that capacity. We haven't provided, I don't think, these numbers in the daily briefing, but you'll see uh, this is the number of ventilators that are in, in use in, in critical care. The numbers along the bottom you'll see are the ones being used for COVID-19 patients at present, and that number as of, uh, as of the 14th of April was 38, having peaked at 55. And the number on the top is the total mechanical ventilators in use for all purposes, for all patients in British Columbia. And so you can see again that um, our preparations, that our needs at the moment are well under the preparations we've made. Uh, that said, we have to continue to make preparations in the coming months uh, for our health care system as, uh, in, uh, in advance of this fall, for example, in advance of the possibility of further surges in infection from COVID-19, and we intend to continue to do so. So what are the key findings? That uh, we've carefully reviewed and articulated specific available critical care beds as well as potential surge beds in other spaces within sites. Surge beds identified surpass even the demands of the Italian uh, model curves if they had occurred, which they did not. Additionally, uh, additional adult capable critical care ventilators have been identified, purchased and loaned, and 681 would surpass numbers required for even the Italian modeled curves. Uh, critical care capacity uh, in BC and thus far in the epidemic has been sufficient. As you know, we have many thousands uh, empty beds at the moment. As a province as a whole, critical care capacity uh, just in the ICU and the high acuity units, not counting the additional surge capacity we, uh, we had, has been at 70 percent over this period. And uh, of course, um, I would say, and this is the time to just briefly mention that uh, obviously for all those people who have been waiting for non-urgent elective surgeries. Uh, these are critical things that we're looking at in the coming weeks and months. We are developing under the direction of the former uh, president of the Fraser Health Authority, Michael Marchbank, a plan at some point in the future to resume elective surgeries. We believe that will be in May and we will have more details about that plan as it comes forward. But as you can see, that planning has to take into account the circumstances that we've described here because we'd be moving 
bring beds that are currently um, now right now surplus to our needs for COVID-19 back to support elective surgeries and so that is a uh, will be um, a very challenging plan to put together one that will require working with surgeons and and many others in the system uh, as we plan to implement it and we'll brief you in full uh, as uh, as we develop that plan in the coming uh, days and weeks so uh, with that I want to return it to uh, to Dr. Henry to talk about the effect of our public health measures, how they have succeeded, and what has succeeded. Let me just catch up here. <laughs> Okay, so this is, uh, this is the uh, important part around um, we've shown you where we've been, where we've come to, now's our, our thinking about where do we go from here. This again is the timeline that I presented earlier. It has on it marked some of the key milestones of the timings when we put in place certain measures. And what it shows again is that we have had a decrease. We've had a decrease in new cases even though we have expanded testing once again. This next slide is a really interesting one. It's some of the modeling that we've been doing at the BCCDC and with UBC and Simon Fraser working with us on this. Um, and it, it compares where we were in British Columbia at the time that we put in some of these public health measures. And it uses what we call a stringency index. Um, I would not have come up with that term myself, however, this was developed at Oxford and it's a way of comparing the, the measures that have been put in place in jurisdictions around the world and comparing how strong they were in forcing or, or um, acquire, requiring physical distancing and other measures that kept people from being able to transmit this virus in our communities. And what we look at, if we look at BC, Across the, the, the right hand side, the, the uh, line that you see that's kind of an orange, that's the trajectory that we presented in one of the slides earlier. So that's our cases per million over time. And the blue dots reflect the, um, the public health measures that we put in place. So things like the social distancing, things like the closing of schools, the closing of restaurants, the, the uh, orders around um, travel, around mass gatherings. And as you can see from the dots, we actually put those in place rather rapidly within a short period of time and our stringency was quite high. It was up about 80% on this scale. And we did that at a time that was relatively early on in our um, increase in numbers of cases. So that, I think, is one of the things that kept us in good stead, that allowed us, because people adhered to these actions, allowed us to bend our curve. And if we compare to Canada, which is up on the, on the right-hand side, um, they took very stringent measures as well in provinces across Canada, and this is particularly Ontario and Quebec. Um, and the stringency was a slightly lower but uh, about as high as we did but it took over time and it also happened at a different point in the exponential growth of the of the outbreak in those provinces and we learned from that and we we put in our measures at the same time as Quebec did for example but we learned from our colleagues in Quebec because their March break happened to be prior to ours and um, we in our discussions across the province they started to recognize that there were people coming back, particularly from travel to France, and that they were becoming sick and spreading it in the community in Quebec. And we took advantage of the experience that they were having to be able to, to put the measures that we needed in place early in BC. If we look at Italy, which is directly below BC on this, um, this graph, again, they put in very stringent measures in Italy, but it was at a time where they had already started to see exponential growth in cases in the community. So there's a couple of things that this tells me. One is our early testing strategy, where we did a lot of testing in our community, helped us to better understand where transmissions were happening. So we did have a good sense of where we were at the time when we started to see community transmission and an increase in the cases that we were seeing in BC. And we also learned from what others were doing around the world. 
On the next slide, this is a, um, uh, um, a measure of how people in BC have reacted to the public health measures that we have asked about. And it is a partnership that the BC CDC has had with Google to look at um, where people have been moving in BC. And it's quite a busy slide, but what it shows is that since we put in place those um, public health measures that we're talking about, the safe distancing, the closing of schools, the working from home, the staying at home message, people in BC did follow that message. And we saw a dramatic decrease increase in um, people moving to workplaces, to transit, to retail and recreation facilities, and to even to groceries and pharmacies. And we saw an increase in people staying near home. The, the green bars that go up and down at the top, those are uh, visits to parks. And this is has been an important part of our strategy is that it is important, we believe, for mental and social health to, for people to be able to go outside, but to do it safely and to maintain those safe distances when they are outside. So this is um, a, a, the summary of our current state. And now I want to talk a little bit about, you know, what does that mean for now? What does that mean for going forward? So we are you know, our actual case rate and our actual ICU admission and hospital admissions had been below what was potential based on the experience of other jurisdictions around the world. We are experiencing a slowing of our rate of new infections and we want that to continue. We need that to continue for us to um, be able to move to the next stage. The difference between what could have been and what actually happened here in BC is because of the measures that we as, as people in BC took together, each of us individually and collectively. The social distancing, the social connectedness, the physical distancing that we took. The fact that we took it to heart that we needed to stay home and stay with our families and our households. The fact that we took it to heart to clean our hands, to make sure that we were um, cleaning our environment to make sure that we stayed away from others if we were sick ourselves. Those were the things that have um, allowed us to bend that curve here in BC. This slowdown is due to our public health actions. It's not due to what we call in epidemiology herd immunity or what I prefer to call community immunity. Um, which, which occurs in one of two ways, and we've talked about this before. One is if a large number of people become infected and survive, and therefore have immunity going forward. And the other, of course, is when we have a vaccine that's able to protect people in our community. So we do not have enough people who have been infected, which is a good thing in our community, to have herd immunity from infection. And we don't want that, because we know that even in those areas like Italy, like Hubei, where they've had um, explosive of outbreaks in their in their um, in the community. E even then, only a small proportion of the community actually has immunity over time. What we really need is a vaccine, and it's going to be some time before we get a vaccine. So, how do we manage that time in between? Our goal, as we move forward, is to control the transmission and growth of any new cases of COVID-19 in our community and minimizing any of the negative unintended consequences of these public health measures that we put in place. And so that is, that is our dilemma and what we need to focus on for the coming weeks and months is just the right amount of restriction so that we don't end up having those explosive growth, so we don't end up overwhelming our health care system and our critical care um, system. And we are still able to start moving to get uh, our health care system moving again and to get our society moving again. So how are we going to do that? We have a number of tools that we have been developing over time and that we will be using and are using to help um, guide our policies and our, our uh, plans and strategies for moving forward. We have epidemiologists across BC who have been working on this, and again, I thank them. There are several different types of models. Uh, one is a forecasting model that can predict uh, new cases and uh, help us understand the impacts if we do certain things. And the other are what we call dynamic models, and they're, they sound simple, but they're quite complicated, and they take into account our demographics, the way we move and interact with each other in our communities, and we're using those as well to help us understand. And these are tools 
tools that will support us in the work that we've been doing and will continue to do about how we can safely and thoughtfully reopen our society and reopen um, business and our health care system. I will caution though, it is not going to be the same. We are not going back to, um, right now, what we had in, in December. It's not going to be the same. Our new normal for the coming months, and it may be some time, is going to be uh, uh, modifications of what we're seeing right now. This is an example of one of the models um, that we're using to help guide what we're looking at uh, for our future. And it is one of the, the uh, you know, what what this, says to me it reinforces our need to stay the course for now. When we look at where we are, those yellow bars give you an example. This is uh, looking at critical care. So it's one of the models, it's not the only one, but it looks at where we are now and where we need to be. And the, the lines on this look at um, the, the restrictions that we've put in place, the public health restrictions that we've just talked about. And as you can see, the, the red line that goes dramatically up very soon, that's if we take everything away and start going back to what we thought was normal um, in December. And that is what we want to, and need to avoid. All of the sacrifices that we have been making across BC for the last month and even longer will be for naught if we don't continue to take those measures now and thoughtfully and carefully open up as we are able to and to make sure that we are monitoring carefully across the communities, across BC, um, to make sure that we don't end up um, having a surge that overwhelms our system in the coming weeks. So we are on the right track, but we must hold that line. Together we have made good decisions and we've made them at the right time and people in BC have done the work that we need to do. Like we have done already, we are going to develop an evidence-based and thoughtful plan for our way forward. It is essential that everybody in BC continue to practice what we have been doing, our physical distancing for the near future. We have had success in BC by being diligent and being thoughtful and working together and supporting each other to get through this. And we need to continue that. And you know, this is not the end for us. It's not even the beginning of the end. And to quote Churchill, it, it is perhaps maybe the end of the beginning, but it is a thoughtful process that we need to continue for the coming weeks and months. And I'm going to leave it at that and say thank you, and we're happy to take your questions. Oh, I'm sorry. Just to just to say a few things. First of all, um, uh, as you might expect, uh, especially yesterday, uh, Dr. Henry and myself and Deputy Minister Steve Brown uh, presented this to a lot of people in the healthcare system, to the opposition, and to others, and we had a chance to reflect on these slides a little bit. And there's a lot of hope uh, here. And some fear, of course, as there continues to be. The hope is obvious. It's in the work that Dr. Henry, the Steve Brown, and so many of the teams that work with them have done. It's really extraordinary. And I, well, we talked a lot about the actions in March. What happened in January and February uh, in slowing the transmission of COVID-19 in BC, led by Dr. Henry, led by Mr. Brown, the prepare, preparations that were made in all our health authorities, from the regional health authorities to the First Nations health authorities, made an enormous difference at that time. And we have to recognize that. And the hope also comes from all of you, the people watching us today, the people of BC, all of them who have delivered their share, sometimes with uh, enormous sacrifice, sometimes with small sacrifice, but it has made an enormous difference. You see that in what Dr. Henry has just presented, the difference that you have made to the extent that their hope, it's the hope of a community that has come together to protect one another and to love one another. And of course, there's fear because we're a long way from done. We're a long way from done. And uh, I want to say that uh, we know that this pandemic won't be over until a significant portion, a majority of the world's population, it becomes immune to this new virus. And that will not happen for some time. We are hopeful and supportive of efforts for a vaccine, but they are going to take a while 
uh, to develop. We've made, I think, together some good decisions and followed through together in a way that has led to positive results. We've asked people to be 100% all in and to a remarkable degree, they have. I appreciate all those decisions and we appreciate they have consequences. We talk about uh, unintended but understood consequences. It's bad for our health not to have school classes going on. It's bad for our health that people are unemployed. It's bad for our health that surgeries are cancelled. It's bad for our health that we can't visit our loved ones in long-term care. And so I think that our efforts though to suppress the virus that it has had clear goals that we all share and we can take some solace in that and indeed some hope. Those, those goals of protecting lives, of ensuring our health system is not overwhelmed as we've seen in other countries to keep us safe as much as we can and to push uh, the impact of the virus along as we develop responses both in testing and in vaccine. Our next big challenge, of course, is to continue to achieve this goal, these goals without undermining our social fabric, without undermining our economy, to understand that this is going to be not just weeks, but months and conceivably years. We must find a healthy way forward for the next 12 to 18 months, as Dr. Henry has said, a healthy new normal that can sustain us and that keeps us safe, that, uh, that allows us to resume some of our activities in a safe way that allows us to socialize in a safe way more with our family and friends. There are, of course, extreme approaches as to what to do, it's to continue to be uh, in these, these uh, restrictions for months and months and months and months with the consequences positive, perhaps, but also negative that come from them. Or others who might suggest that we should simply res lift restrictions. And we saw in the graph and the modeling that Dr. Henry uh, presented what the consequences of that would be. We can't go back to last December right now. So together what we have to do is we have to use our strengths to find a middle road between those kinds of extremes. We need to find a way that successfully continues to suppress the spread of the virus, keeps our loved ones as safe as possible, but gets our society moving again at some point. We need to find a way forward that allows us to socialize and to be what we are as human beings. Whatever actions we take, we know that there's a significant human cost if we get it wrong. The situation is complex and it is without precedent in our lifetimes, I think, and uh, it may be without precedent in the modern age. We have never been collectively this confined as a community and thus we've never had to determine how to become less confined than we are now. And this will be a difficult process that's going to involve creativity and imagination and care and adaptation, consistent adaptation, so that we don't le lose the gains we've made. Led by the Premier and across all our ministries of government, led by Dr. Bonnie Henry and her senior public health team, led by Stephen Brown, we are working hard to shape that way forward. And, and we'll see that, I think, in the early part of May, where we can start talking about uh, new models and the work that Dr. Henry has talked about so that we can help to shape together and let all, everyone participate in what we hope will be not the old normal, not going to back the way things were, but a new normal that might work for us in BC. So today I want to just recognize all of you and to thank all of you. I am profoundly grateful for what everyone has done. I know the Premier is, I know Dr. Henry is, I know everybody in our system is and has been working so hard. The folks at the BC CDC who, who literally haven't had a day off in months because of their commitment. And for all of you, for all of your efforts, we have to. What being 100% all in may change, but we have to continue to be 100% all in together for the ones we love and for the ones we don't know. Nous sommes sur la bonne voie, nous devons continuer. Ensemble, nous avons pris de bonnes décisions et mené à bien avec ténacité. Comme nous l'avons déjà fait, nous pouvons élaborer un plan réfléchi, fondé sur des preuves, pour nous guider sur cette voie inconnue. Il est essentiel que tout le monde en Colombie-Britannique continue de pratiquer la distanciation physique jusqu'à diriger à faire autrement.
Nous savons que nous sommes toujours confrontés au potentiel de croissance des cas et de décès dans notre province. Nous avons réussi en Colombie-Britannique en faisant preuve de diligence et d'attention. Nous, nous pouvons et continuerons sur cette voie et nous le ferons en travaillant ensemble. Thank you very much and we're happy to take your questions. Thank you. Okay, as a reminder to everybody on the line that you um, press star one to enter the queue to ask a question. You are limited to one question only, no follow-ups. And please unmute your phones. You will not be audible until we call your name. First question is from Dirk Meisner, Black Press. Go ahead, Dirk. Hi, uh, um, Dr. Henry. Um, the Premier earlier this week said uh, that people of BC should be congratulating themselves when, once they hear and see the modeling that you put out today. I, I'm wondering what you, um, what, what can you say to the people's efforts to, to that, that have been shown out in these modeling, this modeling today? Uh, well, I think that's very clear. Um, it is the work that we have done together to follow that advice, to, to stay close to home, to stay close to our families, to keep those safe distances, to clean our hands, to stay away from others if we're ill. That has what may, has made the difference for us in British Columbia. And, and, I, and we are profoundly grateful because it is the way that we have come through this together but we're not out of it yet. We're still in the eye of that storm and we still have to watch what's happening around the world and we need to continue to support each other, to be kind to each other and to continue to be safe. Sorry, Dirk, I said black. It's black press. No, it's Canadian press, not black press. Okay, next question is from Mary Griffin, Czech News. Oh, hi. Thanks very much for this. Um, I was just wondering, Dr. Henry, um, in slide number 34, um, I'm just wondering, can you give us a, a bit of a picture of what 60% of normal will look like and when potentially we could hope to achieve that? And you had said earlier that um, the cases in some of the health regions, such as uh, the Vancouver Island Health Authority, the cases were imported. Have you given any consideration to stronger measures on tr restricting travel to places like the island? Uh, yes, yeah, so uh, a couple of things. So this is a model. So all of it, it is is gives us some ideas of the things that could happen. And really what we're looking at, um, and if you look at this, you, you see that we're not at the point where we can let off those restrictions yet. But there is some room in the future for us to say, what does it look like to in maintain distance but have more social contact, to have some businesses open up again, to have our health system open up again to allow for those people who have had those critical procedures uh, postponed. And we have to find that balance. We need to find the balance of, of you know, how much contact still protects us in our communities and our families but allows us to open things up. So I can't tell you exactly what it looks like, but I can tell you we're looking at every specific um, part of our society and it needs to work together because we need to have things like some children going back to school in a classroom situation to allow for increased um, healthcare workers to be able to um, increase our, our activities in the health sector. So what does that look like in a way that is um, still able to maintain distances? It may mean smaller classes only some um, children going to school at certain times, uh, none of the mingling that we used to have with kids um, getting together, um, as well as uh, some um, hybrid perhaps of um, of some kids, uh, some children doing remote learning while others are in a classroom situation and made it able to maintain those safe distances in that situation. Same for businesses. You know, there will be some hybrid for a period of time there, where people are working from home and smaller numbers are in the workplace, for example. I don't think we're going to be getting away from having smaller numbers in our grocery stores and lining up and having those patients to do that um, in the near future, in the coming months. But we need to look at how we can increase our social interactions as well because we know that's important for us for our mental health uh, as well. So that's what this model um, shows, that there is a, a, some room that we need to plan for and that's the work that we're doing now but we're not at that place yet. And I'm sorry, the second question was around... 
Oh, Very travel. travel. And, uh, you know, what we're talking about is importations um, from other countries. And that's where the border measures are so important. But the, we have restricted non-essential travel within the province. We need to loosen that up a little bit, but do it in a way where we can detect if people have illness. We need to all be very sensitive. And this is something that will not change about staying home and staying away from others if we are at the least bit ill, particularly for the coming weeks and months. Next question is from Binder Sajjan. Go ahead, Binder. Hi there. So just want to ask you about uh, reopening the economy and just wondering if you have a sense of sort of which restrictions are the best candidates for being lifted and or which um, sectors of uh, the economy might be best candidates for reopening and sort of what role you expect testing to take in that. So I'll talk a little bit about the, my perspective and what we're adding to that discussion and, and then Minister Dix can talk about um, the broader e economic um, picture because that is what all of government is looking at. So my focus is saying, okay, what are the important health pieces that need to be in place and can you do those within different industries? Which industries or which business models um, have more interconnectivity? Which ones can you modify? So we, you know, we talked about not traveling, so business travel is something that we need to think about. Having meetings and getting used to having at least partial virtual meetings and not having people coming together in the same way. So those are the, the parameters that we're putting in place from a health perspective. And testing becomes incredibly important. We've opened up our testing again because we want to make sure we're detecting every case that we can in the province um, going forward. It will also be really important and there'll be two parts to it. So one is the, the testing that we continue to do, the, the nucleic acid testing or the, the genetic testing to, to see if somebody has this disease. But we are also, and we've talked about this, going to be adding in the serology testing. And I expect we'll have the ability to do that in the coming weeks before we start opening up. And that helps us in a couple of ways. It helps us understand if the people who have been affected, um, infected and have survived this disease over the last few months, um, have immune going forward and we do expect that they will so we can do testing in our healthcare workers for example to give them confidence around um, being able to care for people with COVID-19. We also can do broad testing in our community of a sample of people to get an understanding of how many people were truly infected. As you know we haven't tested everybody who's had um, signs and symptoms of, of COVID-19 in our community over the past uh, at least the past month because of a variety of reasons, we needed to focus the testing on those that were more likely to have it and more likely to end up in our healthcare system. So we are now opening it up again, like we did in January, to see if we can detect everybody and we need to be able to uh, um, have the public health people to respond to that. So serology is a way of looking back and saying, okay, how many people actually did get infected and giving us a better sense of the, the true numbers of cases in the province. It also is a way of helping us if we start to see uh, cases pop up. So if somebody ends up in hospital in July uh, with, uh, with COVID-19 pneumonia, where did they get it from? And it helps us in our public health investigation to say, okay, well, there was unrecognized transmission um, in these people, and that helps us um, uh, contain and prevent transmission in clusters and outbreaks going forward. So serology testing will be an important part of our future. I think, uh, just to say, I think the last time the legislature met, I was asked about how long we expected the public uh, health measures to be in place, and I think uh, said at that time, and it was, uh, seems like a long time ago, I think it was about March 23rd, that uh, these measures wouldn't change until uh, until the end of April. There was zero chance they would change, and in fact, that's the case, where these measures have to continue to be in place. We have to continue to flatten the curve. We have to continue to succeed. In terms of the uh, of the economy, what we need to do, and the work that Dr. Henry will be leading on the on the uh, on the health side with with Steve Brown, and the the work that the whole of government is dealing with on the economy, will is uh, going to be considerable in the coming weeks, and we're going to come back to you with more modeling, more discussion, more dynamic modeling, in the very early part of May. Um, so that we can start to develop a framework. It won't be necessarily one industry. 
you know, and this is, I think, to the great credit of uh, Dr. Henry, who understands and cares, I think, very deeply about the what sometimes are called the unintended consequences that are really the understood negative consequences of necessary health decisions, that there are many sectors of the economy right now which are continuing to operate and aren't in other jurisdictions. And this is, uh, uh, this has proven to be an effective response. We've applied. Dr. Henry has applied the science to every case. And so as we look at industries, regardless, and imagine the industries in BC, that's going to have to be, continue to be the case in the months to come as we deal with the new normal. But you're going to see uh, in uh, approximately a couple of weeks, maybe a little over a couple of weeks, new modeling and a new framework for how everybody needs to act. And that will have different implications for different industries, of course, because different industries deal in terms of issues of physical and social distancing differently. But uh, I, I think what I can say is that, uh, that this has been consistently our approach, consistently the approach taken by Dr. Henry. It's proved effective so far, but we are going to continue to do what we, what we have been doing, which is follow uh, the advice of Dr. Henry and her team in guiding and directing what we can and we can't do but also, of course, working with all industries in the province to see what is possible in the coming weeks and months. Next question is from Mick Sweetman, CHLY. Go ahead, Mick. Uh, hi, it's a question from the Minister. Um, on slide 22, it shows 951 critical care beds with surge capacity. Um, on slide 25, it just says the, uh, there's a 70% critical care capacity. Uh, does that mean there's currently 666 critical care beds staffed in an operation, or what's the explanation to that? Yeah, uh, 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 Dr. Henry would do it. <laughs> it's probably better than I would, so I'll, I'll, I'll let her uh, finish what I start here. But just to say, I don't have the slide immediately in front of me, but what we've done is we've created more critical care capacity uh, in the province that's included. Uh, things like recovery beds, like cardiac care units that that have been uh, that have been transferred, other surgical care capacity. But then there's there's our base critical care capacity, and I think what you're talking about is the difference between those two. So when we say we're, we've done approximately 45 or 46 percent of our overall the created critical care capacity that we've created in recent weeks, we're, we also want to measure that against our existing critical care capacity so that we know when we go back, for example, to elective surgery what the demand is. So if you take all of the demand, the COVID-19 demand for critical care beds, which is the 960 figure, uh, you're at 45 percent. And if you take off some of those numbers, obviously you get a higher percentage and it's the 70 percent, which is I think what you're asking about. Just to, to uh, if we go back, if and when we go back to um, doing uh, n um, scheduled surgeries, that means that the post-op beds, for example, and the OR beds will no longer be available as part of our surge capacity for critical care. It will be focusing on, you know, where are the ICU and high acuity units only and what proportion of them need to be reserved in case we start seeing surges in people who have COVID-19 over the coming weeks and months and particularly as we go into the fall. We don't know what is going to happen with this virus. We don't know if it's going to naturally wane away during the summer. We have seen some decreases, um, certainly here in BC and across Canada, but we don't yet know if that's because of, only because of the work that we're doing, and I think it is, but whether there's going to be a period of time where we might get a bit of a reprieve. We also don't know if it's going to come back in as, as a surge when our respiratory season starts again in the fall. So we have to keep that in balance and make sure we're able to detect things in our community. If we start to see increases in transmission in our community, making sure we have the surge capacity within our um, health care system to be able to, to manage that as well. So that's what those numbers reflect. Yeah, and just one more. I just say the one more thing that we mentioned, I think, in the pre-briefing, I think I mentioned when we went through the slides, is that it's absolutely our intention in preparation for the fall to continue to increase that capacity so it's not going to be a static number. We clearly have to have and ensure uh, given what uh, Dr. Henry and many others have advised about the fall, we've got to ensure that we have higher capacity and we're going to continue to work that both on the, uh, on, uh, the question of ventilators and on the question of critical care capacity. Next question is from Keith Baldry, Global News. 
Hi there. Uh, first of all, thank you very much for the briefing. It's uh, incredibly valuable information. Uh, one thing, how concerned are you that the public is buying in right now, but as we go through this, as you both of you are talking about months and months and months of this, of social distancing restrictions, of literally no festivals and fairs and things we normally associate with summer, Will the public still be with you to the same degree they're with you right now as they don't see hospitalization cases uh, pile up? And also, given your, your, how you envision the schools to operate, is it realistic to expect those, those measures to be in place in time for any of the current school year to be completed? Yeah, a very good question. Uh, you know what? Uh, one of the reasons why we wanted to present the details that we presented today so people understand that what they're doing, what we are doing, is making a difference and that we don't want that to be for naught. We don't yet know what's going to happen and we are going to do everything we can to make sure we are as close to the line of allowing things to happen as we can. I think that uh, this summer, I believe this summer, we will have the opportunities to have way more social connection than we have had in the last month um, to six weeks. But we're not quite there yet. So I'm asking for patience. I'm asking for us to continue to be kind to each other, to stay safe with each other, and that we will make this through together and we will have opportunities for being together again. And it's not going to be um, as restrictive as we are now, but we need to have those safeguards in place so that we can monitor things in time. And that's what we'll be presenting to you and that's what we'll be sharing with you and we'll be going through this together. In terms of schooling, um, I know the Ministry of Education and the superintendents and the teachers and our um, teaching aides and our early childhood educators are, are thinking about this even now. So we will have um, the ability to support children um, in the coming months, uh, particularly those teens and those young people who are in um, the end of their high school years. This is an important critical transition year for many people and for some of the young people in my life. So yes, we, we are going to make sure that they can um, make that transition uh, from high school into uh, out of high school and, and it will be done in a way that's different but it'll be done in a thoughtful way that supports the, the young people in our communities. Next question is from Lisa Houston, News 1130. Just a little bit more, and you talked about this in the technical briefing earlier about, and you're saying that life is going to not look like normal for a very long time, but people looking at things like traveling, whether either within the province or outside the province and looking at the way our neighbors to the south are behaving, is there any chance that any kind of normal, I know I had a, an airline um, host ask, or are they going to be flying again? Are people going to be traveling again? I, I, I believe so. I don't think, and I'm uh, somebody who really loves travel and both <laughs> have traveled a lot, both for work but also for, for pleasure. Um, and, you know, international travel, the way that we used to think of it, meetings where we all got together, conferences, those are not going to happen this year. Those are not going to happen this year anywhere in the world, and we're all looking at this. I mean, Italy is reeling, Spain is reeling, the United States is still recovering, and we're thinking about that. But we will be increasing our, our connections with our family, with our close connections here in BC and across Canada, and I think in North America. So we'll have to um, do that in a measured way. I do think travel will come back. I think we need to find ways to be able to check on our families, to be able to connect with our loved ones and and those sorts of things will ease up not right now but very soon Ethan Sawyer CBC hi there uh, thanks for taking my question um, it's for dr. Henry uh, we have been seeing some concerning issues with Vancouver Coastal Health over the past few days uh, they declared no new recoveries for a week announced no new cases on Thursday, then declared new outbreaks at previously cleared long-term care facilities, and then retracted that. Um, is Vancouver Coastal Health able to effectively track every case right now? Uh, absolutely. So I think that those are three different things that, that uh, led to some of our confusion in getting out our statement yesterday. So uh, absolutely, there was no new positive cases, despite um, a number of tests, hundreds of tests being done in Vancouver Coastal over the last 24 hours. So that is a true a reflection of the fact that we are seeing less illness in our community right now. Um, they, the thing around um, recovered cases has been because um, they
they've ta undertaken a review in the last few days. When we were going through the period of a lot of cases and a lot of activity, um, they had not had a physician review all of the recovery cases, and so um, we had criteria that were used. So they wanted to make sure, so they're going back and reviewing to make sure that uh, everything was um, done according to the algorithm that we had developed. So uh, I understand that. The, the uh, thing about the outbreaks that were cleared and then um, reactivated, that was a mistake, and that was just an error in somebody transposing um, some information. So um, there's nothing nefarious behind it. It was a series of, of confusion, confusing messages that got uh, uh, done, but just because, um, you know, it's a large, complicated system, and we had some challenges with some of the data and understanding um, things were being called different things by different people, and um, it's just a reflection of, of the amount of data that we're collecting and uh, how we're putting the numbers together. But um, certainly, I have full confidence that Vancouver Coastal is monitoring the situation, and Vancouver Coastal Public Health is actively following up on all cases. So we have time for one more question. For any reporters that didn't get to ask a question today, there will be a statement released later this afternoon. For recommendations, <laughs> for recommendations on protecting families and communities from COVID-19, visit bccdc.ca. For non-medical questions about the province's COVID-19 response, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash COVID-19. And for a full listing of the provincial health officer's orders, visit gov.bc.ca forward slash PHO guidance. Last question is from Matt Preprost, Alaska Highway News. Go ahead, Matt. Uh, hi, good morning. Um, this question is for Dr. Henry. You said many times everybody's pandemic is, is, is going to be different, certainly across the world and in Canada and in BC. And I'm curious to know uh, your insight into how you're seeing uh, things unfold in the north. We've had the slow growth in reported case numbers. I think the most we've had in a day is, is four that have been reported. We know only about 1% of our population has been tested. Um, and right now we know that there's a community outbreak in the Blueberry River First Nation, which represent about um, half of our active cases in the north. What are you observing here? What do you expect in the coming weeks? And where will the north factor into the province's response moving forward in terms of lifting restrictions? Yeah, so the north, um, like all of us, uh, every uh, area of the province has been an integral part in our planning and our monitoring. We have um, been uh, putting in additional um, uh, testing capacity in the north to try and speed up that turnaround time. So we know that was an issue, particularly early on, um, to support communities. We know that there has been community transmission in the north, um, and we know that there's been challenges in helping communities address the transmission in different areas of the north. And they have unique um, challenges given where health services are and where communities are. We have, as well, a strategy to support transportation, so should people need it, and there'll be more coming out about some of those details in the coming days. So, uh, you know, we are looking as a whole and we are um, discussing together, all of us, the planning about the future and it includes um, the nuances that are different in each region. So the interior here on Vancouver Island, the north, the First Nations Health Authority has been in intricately involved in those discussions as well. So um, the strategies might be slightly different or more nuanced, but we'll all be taking the same approach it may be that it's done at a different time, in a different phase, in different parts of the province, but the, uh, the approach will be the same across the province and we'll all continue to work together on that. And I, I just want to say I will be um, giving a briefing here tomorrow at noon, <laughs> just so that you remember, um, and uh, we'll be happy to take more questions then. But uh, thank you very much, everybody, and uh, um, continue to, to stay calm. Um, to be kind to each other and to stay safe. Thank you.